So I'm going to talk about the Wisconsin Central Sands region today and just to kind of organize um, and set us up for a solid discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about the environmental history of the region um, and then the problem and the conflict of irrigated agriculture and surface waters and then a little bit about my work specifically. So first, let's talk about some history. How did the Central Sands come to be the Central Sands? Um, well, there used to be a glacial lake, Lake Wisconsin, and it had a catastrophic draining event. And this draining event le left the coarse sediments in the area, and these cor coarse sediments became what we think of as the Wisconsin Central Sands. And really, the Central Sands are known for their sandy soil. But really, the way in which that we started to see the central sands that it is today and, and the irrigation, that rise of irrigation, it happened after World War II. And it happened because there was an excess of aluminum pipe. And uh, <laughs> using all this aluminum pipe, um, you know, we, we saw just an increase in, in irrigation with high capacity wells in the central sands. So in 1950, there were about 50 uh, high capacity wells in the Wisconsin Central Sands, and we define a high capacity well as any, anything that can pump above a thousand gallons per minute. Um, and in today, there are approximately over 3,500 high capacity wells in the Central Sands. So that's really been the trajectory of growth that we've seen. Um, but with that growth came great agricultural success for our state. And Wisconsin is a top five state for several different vegetables. Um, so number three in the United States for potatoes. Number one, east of the Mississippi. Um, and it's also a top five state for sweet corn, beans, peas. And these crops are really important to our economy. Um, and they're all grown primarily in the central sands, other than the seed potatoes that are grown in, in the Antigo area. So that's great, right? Um, that, that sounds pretty good. What could, what could the problem be? Um, well, the Central Sands region has also been, you know, home to several abundant surface waters. Um, so over 80 lakes, uh, 650 miles of trout streams, and several wetlands in the region. And uh, also there were, you know, prior to the development of um, intensive agriculture, there was very clean drinking water um, from the groundwater system. So I want you to imagine that this is an aquifer, this glass of beer. And if we think about just the surface waters, so our rivers and our lakes are at the top of the aquifer. So here's kind of, this is going to be, this is going to be my river here. And the river, so when you see a river or a lake on the landscape, that's the water table. So I don't know if you can see this. That's the water table. So. If we put a high capacity well, um, one high capacity well, <laughs> in, in, into this aquifer, all right, that's not, that's not so bad. You know, it doesn't really impact the river. But we've been talking a lot about <laughs> cumulative impacts, right? H has anyone heard that term? It's been, it's been in the news a lot. We've been having a lot of policy debates about the cumulative impacts of wells. When you put one well in, should you consider the other wells? So I should have practiced that. <laughs> you can see it's the river that's really going to be impacted in this area. And if we were to keep pumping, <laughs> That river is going to go dry. Um, and this is what's happening out west. They're pumping a lot of gro groundwater, and they're, not <laughs> and they're not replacing it. But here, guess what? We've got rain, right? So we, every year, we have a fair amount of recharge. It comes back in, so we don't see the same types of impacts that they see out west. Um, and we're not worried in our state that we're going to run out of water. But we really want to manage for this top of the aquifer. This is where our surface waters are. The groundwater and the surface waters in our state are connected. 
Um, so what, when, when you impact one, you impact the other. Um, the second thing is that uh, their cumulative impacts are real. You can't um, add one well without really considering how all of the other wells are operating in terms of the groundwater. You know, that said, I want to talk a little bit about my own work. Um, and what I do is I study the water. So what is an environmental biophysicist? I study cycles. So I study the water cycle. I study the energy cycle. I study the nitrogen cycle. After I finished up my degree, you know, I, I took a step back, and I wanted to think about the bigger picture. Because um, I, I had done some work and thought, all right, well, we, we have some estimates for these different numbers and how much water the crops are using. I wanted to think about how we can try to manage water at different scales. So what I'm doing now, the project that I'm working on, is you know, trying to come up with strategies of like how can one farmer save water. Like say one farmer wants to implement conservation strategies on their farm. Um, how, could, how could they save water? Or, or how can a community manage water? And finally, the, the last part of my research is thinking at just this bigger state level of how when we convert you know, forests into irrigated agriculture, how is it going to impact the, wa the water cycle? How is that going to impact our drinking water? Um, and also, how is irrigated agriculture going to, going to impact regional climate? Is it possible to drill uh, a variety of wells, like three, 500 feet, and measure the water table, and then uh, over a period of time to see fluctuations? Yes, and I mean, these, these records actually exist. And um, some of my collaborators at the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey and the USGS have very strong monitoring records and are, and are using them from these types of monitoring wells. It sounds like Mother Nature kind of saves us from whatever things we're doing to the earth by raining every so often, it refills our aquifers. My question is, if we had a standard, a, a certain amount of rainfall every year, and we, we use the water as we use now, would would the water level in the aquifers go down? So first I want to address this issue of Mother Nature saving us with, with the recharge. So I don't think she is, um, because I, I, and I, I didn't talk too much about this, but yes, she, she gives us more water, um, but she's not cleaning this up, mm -hmm. right? So that's one area where, you know, from, from a perspective of um, nitrates going into the water, we we're fertilizing our groundwater. Um, and and what we, that is one thing where we won't be saved from that unless we start to think creatively about solutions um, to clean up our groundwater. So your question I, I thought was really interesting about the will, will things stay the same um, if, if nothing else changes? And I actually um, did a study and it, it was published last year, kind of looking at that with my field data, of the will, will this stay the same? And it, in, uh, in physical terms, we say, like, are, do we have a system at steady state? Um, and the answer is yes, actually. So it, and that kind of gets back to what was mentioned earlier about are we managing for depletion? No, we're not managing for depletion. We're not going to keep losing water. Things are going to generally stay the same, but there's going to be fluctuation. Oh, I'd have to fill back to my river. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's going to be fluctu the fluctuation. Like, where is that steady state fluctuation happening? Well, it's happening in this area that we really care about. Like, we, we don't want this little bit of fluctuation. We're not going to go way down here, but we're going to see this little bit of fluctuation here. Um, so I guess stay the same is kind of a relative term, right?